welcome. Sorry, this very short uh, welcome address. Um, one second. Get rid of this message that's telling me it's being recorded. Um, this very short welcome address uh, to, to welcome all the new uh, members uh, of the Thomas Young Center. So thank you for joining us. Um, so the Thomas Young Center is the London Center for Theory and Simulation of uh, Materials and Molecules. Um, and it was founded in uh, 2006 um, because uh, A, there is a, there is a concentration of expertise in, in theory and simulation of materials and molecules in, in London. Um, and B, because this is a really exciting, uh, exciting area. It's, a, it's very difficult to think of a modern technology um, that isn't underpinned in some way, shape or form by a material at its core that uh, does some function or has some property uh, that makes that technology work the way it does. Um, and the reason uh, this field is exciting is that, you know, we work on understanding why these materials have those properties and trying to optimize them to do what they do uh, better, more efficiently, uh, more cost effectively. And that way you can have a big impact on, on technology. Um, stepping, stepping back even, even more uh, and looking at some of the global challenges that face uh, face us in the 21st century, uh, many of those challenges um, have, you know, very big societal and political and economic uh, dimensions, of course. But again, uh, there are materials issues at the heart of them. So if you think about energy, if you think about climate change, if you think about fresh water supply, these are all problems that have uh, materials issues uh, at their heart. And by working in this area, one can make very big contributions to some of these very big uh, global challenges. Um, so as I said, founded in 2006, so um, next year will be our 15th uh, anniversary. Um, and we are an alliance of over 100 uh, research groups based at the four universities of Imperial College uh, London, UCL, Queen Mary University of London, and King's College London. Um, and we're all working to tackle uh, <clears throat> societal and technological issues via theory and simulation of materials and molecules. Um, I'll talk about some of the uh, activities um, that we do. So uh, before then, I'll introduce to you uh, the co-directors um, at the other institutions. So Carla Molteni, Professor Carla Molteni is the director at King's. Professors Jochen Blumberger and Alex Schluger are the co-directors at uh, UCL and, and uh, professors Rachel Otero Crespo and uh, Divis de Tommaso are the co-directors at Queen Mary. Um, there are some very, very important people uh, that you will get to know. So uh, these are the TYC uh, coordinators and support staff and managers uh, at the various institutions. So there's Hafiza Bibi at Imperial, Karen Stoneham at UCL and Colin Rainey at Queen Mary. Um, so uh, you, will, you will hear from these guys by email during the course of the year quite a lot. Um, so why are we called the Thomas Young Center? Um, Thomas Young, uh, there's, a, there's a famous uh, a biography of him uh, that's, been, that's been written called The Last Man Who Knew Everything. Um, it's, a, it's a short book and I highly recommend it because um, it details the, the life and work of this truly fascinating individual, Thomas Young, who uh, lived uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And you may have heard, you know, in your uh, <clears throat> undergraduate education um, and, and school education about various things that are called the Young's this and Young's that and whatever. And you may never have connected the dots that actually these are all the same person. I mean, he really uh, contributed in a major way to several areas of um, science and engineering uh, from you know, the very famous wave theory of light and the Young's double slit experiment, which I'm sure you've heard of, and elasticity theory, Young's modulus, uh, the theory of surface tension. Um, but he was also a practicing medic. So there's a, 
rule in medicine called Young's rule, which is about you know the dosage of a medicine that you should deliver to a child um, as opposed to an adult. Uh, he was a practicing uh, doctor uh, in in London. He was a professor at the Royal Institution, and something that actually uh, I didn't know until I'd, I'd read the autobiography was that he, he was a contributor to the Encyclopedia Britannica in a major, major way. So he wrote dozens, if not hundreds of articles for Encyclopedia Britannica, but um, anonymously because he didn't want to know that uh, it was all him. Um, and uh, sort of going away from science and engineering, uh, he was instrumental in decoding the Rosetta Stone, which those of you who are who are new to London, once you know things are more back to normal, you can go and have a look at the Rosetta Stone in uh, in the British uh, Museum up by UCL. So he really was a, a remarkable person, and so you know it was very natural for a a centre that is sort of very interdisciplinary uh, to um, name name itself after after this person. So that's why we're called the Thomas Young Centre. The way we're organised internally. Um, is through these five uh, TYC interest groups. So uh, functional materials, structural materials, soft and biological matter, surfaces, interfaces, and catalysis, and methods of simulating materials and molecules. And um, you will hear uh, from the spokespersons for the, from the interest group leaders of each of these groups uh, in a second um, about why each of these areas is very, very exciting. Um, some of the activities that we do normally, these would of course all be face to face, but because of uh, COVID restrictions, um, everything at the moment is, is being done online. We have a very active series of seminars and workshops. Um, these include highlight seminars from top academics from around the world, uh, international workshops um, in collaboration with uh, European organizations like SciK and CCAM, um, who, which, which you will learn more about uh, during your PhD, no doubt. And then each of the interest groups will organize sort of uh, annual symposia um, as well. Uh, in, in early 2021, we hope to hold um, the uh, um, TYC Student Day as well, um, which is something that uh, will be of great interest to you because that's where the final year PhD students in the in the center, give presentations on their on their research, um, and everyone is invited to that. Um, something that uh, you might be interested in, maybe a little bit later in your PhDs, uh, are these junior research fellowships that we that we provide, which give you a little bit of funding to initiate uh, collaborations with um, with groups outside of the TYC. Um, so have a look on the website for the details of of that and. Uh, we can also host visiting professors. I mean, again, uh, this, this would be for when things go back to, back to normal, um, to come and stay with us in the TYC uh, from, from other institutions to give uh, master classes and highlight seminars. Um, something that, uh, as new students, you'll be, I'm sure, very interested in is the TYC materials modeling course. Um, this is a course that runs on uh, every Wednesday um, from now until, until the end of the academic year, pretty much, and covers a range of, um, a range of topics uh, related to theory and simulation of materials. Um, and uh, again, at the moment, this is all, uh, all the lectures are pre-recorded and there are written notes available um, with live tutorials on, on Wednesdays. Uh, so this is something that I would recommend uh, that you have a look at and consider uh, very seriously attending because I think it will be very good for your general education in materials. So do have a, do have a look at that. Uh, information is available on the TYC website. Um, the TYC also leads uh, a tier two high performance computing center um, called the Materials and Molecular Modeling Hub. This is a uh, tier two facility. So tier two means it, it, it's, a, it's a resource that's at a scale that sits just below uh, what would be considered a, a major national facility, which is sort of what a tier one facility would be, and above uh, a tier three facility, which is what typically um, an institution or research group might, might have uh, internally. 
Um, so in the UK, there are seven of these tier two centers and the Materials and Molecular Modeling Hub, which is led by the TYC, is one of those. And uh, this resource is available to you uh, to use. Um, and to find out how to do that, uh, go to the MMM Hub website, which is mmmhub.ac.uk, and you'll find out more about it. So this is a, uh, I should also say, this is a 23,000 core um, uh, cluster that you can use to run your calculations. The uh, Thomas Young Center website is uh, where you can get uh, all of the information about events and uh, the people in the TYC and several other things as well. Um, so uh, that's a great source of, source of information. Um, we have a Twitter feed as well that you should, if you're, a, if you're one of these Twitterati, um, you should uh, follow uh, the TYC, I think it's called TYC underscore London. Uh, you should follow that. And very importantly, um, if you're not already on the TYC's mailing lists and on the mailing lists of the interest groups that you're interested in, uh, please do email either Karen or Hafiza or Colin uh, and get yourself onto those mailing lists because that's the way that you will find out about all the things uh, that we're doing. And importantly, I'd like to encourage all of you to get involved in suggesting things for us to do. Um, you know, this is a grassroots organization. So the members are what make it what it is, and that means you. And so we really want to hear your ideas as to the sorts of things we should do, the sorts of things, people we should invite uh, to, give, to give seminars, the sorts of workshops we should run, so please, please, please be active and get involved. We really uh, would appreciate that. Okay, so that's all from me. This is what's gonna happen in the rest of the session. So you're gonna have some rapid fire talks from the five uh, TYC interest group leaders. Then there's gonna be a panel Q&A with some current TYC students who can tell you what it's really like being in the TYC. And then there'll be some breakout discussions in smaller groups uh, at the end. So I'll end there. Happy to take any questions if there are any, but otherwise I'll hand back to Karen. Thanks very much, Arash. That was a great introduction to the Thomas Young Center. Um, next on the agenda, we're going to hear, as Arash said, from our interest group leads. And first up is Clotilde Kuchinotta for, uh, from Imperial College London. So Clotilde, if you'd like to... Um, Put your, mic, your camera on, your microphone, that's great. Yes. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. I think it's better if I leave it uh, like this because uh, I'm not sure if uh, it is going to work uh, uh, if I go through the screen. I think, is it visible? It is, yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just uh, uh, my name is uh, Clotilde Cucinotta. Uh, indeed, I am the spokesperson of uh, the Surfaces and Interfaces uh, um, Interest Group of, uh, of uh, um, TYC, uh, which uh, focuses on uh, catalysis, uh, electrochemistry, and uh, uh, nanostructures. And uh, uh, just uh, uh, a few words to illustrate uh, why uh, interfaces and surfaces are uh, important. Uh, actually, interfaces and surfaces uh, are uh, where the action happens uh, in uh, uh, many different uh, uh, technologies. Uh, so we are at the moment uh, facing the uh, challenge and the need uh, to integrate new materials into devices uh, to make them uh, uh, more uh, uh, appealing uh, from a commercial point of view and uh, uh, 
therefore contribute uh, uh, to a better world, a more sustainable, more uh, um, performant, uh, uh, more uh, healthier and uh, uh, more uh, desirable world. And, uh, and uh, for this, uh, we need to understand surfaces. Uh, the applications where uh, understanding surfaces and interfaces are uh, relevant range from, uh, uh, from uh, um, energy, uh, water splitting devices, batteries, uh, fuel cells, solar cells, photoelectrochemical cells for uh, uh, hydrogen production, uh, let's say the fuel of the future, uh, or uh, uh, sensors, uh, or uh, um, electrochemical uh, gating devices, uh, memory stores, but also processes uh, uh, such as corrosion uh, um, or uh, uh, medical uh, or uh, uh, or uh, um, uh, process relevant for medicine and biology like neurotransmission all uh, occur at interfaces between uh, different materials so it's uh, crucially important that we understand uh, these uh, uh, interfaces and uh, uh, yeah and so this uh, uh, explain why uh, there are so many fundamental and applied studies of surfaces and interfaces um, and why these are criti of critical importance in developing these new technologies to meet today's challenges. Um, here I just uh, I wanted to give a general overview, there is no time to get into any detail, into what are the main uh, general objectives of the uh, community which has in mind developing these devices and the typical uh, area of research uh, where people uh, invest uh, uh, more effort. So overall, uh, uh, we need uh, uh, to, uh, as I said, develop novel materials and processes. Uh, and in particular, uh, we need to develop uh, novel uh, uh, catalysts, uh, which, uh, 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 which are more uh, selective, uh, efficient, affordable. And so this means that uh, they are made of uh, cheap uh, or earth abundant uh, uh, materials. Uh, uh, we need to achieve uh, high turnover rates uh, uh, towards the desired product. Uh, we need to have uh, uh, durability, a sufficient lifetime uh, in the environment where these materials uh, operate. And, uh, um, we, uh, and uh, uh, we need, of course, to develop this concept together uh, with uh, industrial and societal uh, stakeholders. Uh, all these uh, objectives uh, are generally uh, common to the current research in the, which is uh, 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 central for, uh, let's say, the energy, uh, the energy uh, sector. And so, for instance, there is a lot of research in uh, synthetic fuels, uh, uh, in understanding how to produce synthetic fuels with novel uh, uh, electrochemical and thermochemical uh, catalytic processes. Uh, and all these applies for the, uh, it is very important, it's very, very, um, uh, very um, hot at the moment, the research on uh, understanding how to produce new chemicals from uh, um, N2 or CO2 reduction. Uh, as I mentioned before, we want to produce new fuels. And so maybe one of the most important area we should uh, really try to uh, advance uh, is to uh, develop uh, efficient water splitting uh, processes uh, for sustainable uh, H2 production. And these occur also through nanostructuring, one of the other keywords, uh, which is uh, part of the uh, focus of the interest uh, group. For instance, uh, they, uh, there are now many popular nanostructured electrodes possibly done with low dimensional materials. Um, another uh, huge field, which is really at the core uh, of the interest of the scientific community working on uh, surfaces and interfaces is also how to develop uh, novel battery concepts. Uh, now we have new ideas, uh, for 
instance, uh, redox flow batteries or uh, uh, sodium ion batteries, dual uh, flow batteries. Uh, all these uh, are the main uh, focus, the technological focus. But how to achieve, we, we, we achieve these? Uh, and because we are theoreticians and so we want to have an understanding, we typically, our approach is to understand uh, how to uh, get there to these general call, goals. Uh, this uh, overall happens by the coupling of atomic scale me mechanistic insight to reaction kinetics and mass transport phenomena at longer length scales with the ultimate goal of elucidating uh, critical activity and selectivity descriptors for high value products. So this means that uh, we need to understand from the most fundamental uh, uh, processes uh, which occur uh, at the interface at the atomistic level, so understanding the electronic uh, structure, interface properties, but then and how all these uh, uh, properties uh, are informed and inform uh, the electrolyte properties, the diffusions of different species which occur in solution and the relevance of the different types. And crossing these special and time scales, uh, understanding uh, the general objective would be to crossing these spatial and time scales to really progress towards better commercial uh, devices. Uh, from the theory side, uh, this uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of, of research uh, is, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, in, is developed in trying to advance uh, uh, the uh, realistic ab initio modeling of uh, uh, the interfaces between electrode and electrolyte interfaces. Uh, there are challenges here, and so all these topics listed here are really uh, hot. Uh, how to model charged interfaces? Uh, how, if we want to model the electrochemical process, uh, should we really uh, take into account of the complexity of the environment where where uh, uh, these reactions uh, occur and uh, how can we model the kinetics in uh, uh, in such uh, of uh, this reaction in in such uh, in such uh, environment how can we bridge different time scales and there are several uh, uh, approaches here that uh, are proposed uh, overall uh, and are uh, um, the most popular at the moment uh, uh, from uh, the traditional approach using uh, uh, techniques uh, which makes possible really to simulate chemical reaction. We know now have a, a huge literature about uh, this uh, to integrating uh, our current knowledge, uh, uh, current knowledge uh, from different fields. Uh, for instance, it's very popular the research in trying to uh, develop, uh, um, to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to develop new potentials, which make possible to make uh, uh, calculations which are uh, uh, as accurate as ab initio, but in a shorter time scale, uh, at a shorter, sorry, uh, in a shorter, uh, m much fast, m uh, faster uh, simulation, or combining different methodologies, uh, let's say kinetic Monte Carlo and DFT, DFT and microkinetical kinetic analysis, or even just uh, trying to input all uh, the information that we developed by understanding all these models into macroscopic uh, methods and models. Uh, overall, uh, uh, when uh, uh, working uh, at sur with surfaces and interfaces, uh, therefore poses uh, uh, challenges to theorists, experimentalists, and requires to combine different perspectives. Uh, the industry perspective, uh, uh, the um, perspective of the theorist and the perspective of uh, experimentalist. Uh, I would say that uh, um, the industry perfect, uh, perspective is that uh, uh, they put money where there is potential. And so at the moment, for instance, electrocatalysis is really uh, uh, at the far front of the interest of uh, uh, industry. There is uh, uh, the need uh, and uh, industry start feeling the need for more discussion uh, with company, with, uh, with the scientists. And uh, they would like to have uh, predictive descriptors uh, of uh, not simple rationalization of existing results. 
from experimental point of view, uh, there is a lot of research in the direction of expanding uh, the number of observables and methodologies uh, that can be accessed. And a lot of uh, progress can uh, derive uh, in this field uh, from the uh, combine, combine the effort of uh, experimentalists and theorists. So the requirement that typically theorists ask uh, experimentalists, please don't see theories only as number crunchers, but try to work together to uh, understand uh, these fundamental processes. And what is the challenge for you, uh, theorists, uh, is to make prediction. And to this end, uh, you don't need to, you, you, you need to remember uh, that that trends are always better than single numbers and that uh, you need to be able at the very end uh, to use different tools uh, according to the problem and to be bold, uh, invent new tools uh, if necessary, borrow from other fields uh, as it is being doing at the moment, machine learning, molecular electronics are now combined with uh, uh, traditional surface science uh, approaches. Uh, so overall, uh, you are the new generations in uh, which will progress the, the field of surfaces and interfaces. Uh, so uh, I concluded this little presentation, uh, inviting you to reflect uh, what are your thoughts on these topics? Uh, do you see connection between different fields possible in this field uh, or uh, you see uh, differences which are uh, not possible to be addressed? Or uh, uh, what would you like to convey convey and teach to your supervisors uh, about this topic, uh, what would you like to learn uh, to ta take all the challenges of electrocatalysis efficiently and uh, productively? And uh, this is all from my side. That's great. Thank you so much, Clotilde. Um, if we could swiftly move on to Devis Di Tommaso from Queen Mary. Thanks, Devis. Yeah. Uh, let me share my screen. Yes, I think I need to. Okay, so. So good afternoon, my name is David Tommaso and I'm a senior lecturer in computational chemistry at Queen Mary University. I'm uh, one of the co-directors of the, of the TYC and also the spoken person for the Structural Materials Interest Group, IG5. Uh, so uh, I just want to go over a very good, but in order to give an overview of structural material, which is a very complex and wide um, field, I want to just give an example of a few, of few uh, talks, a uh, few activities that have been carried out uh, previously, and also show what activities are planned for, for next year. So one of the most probably, uh, one of the very interesting, told, one of the very, very interesting activities that we organized was about uh, multi-scale methods for cementitious materials. So probably you are aware that cements are probably the, uh, the material that is mostly produced in the world, is responsible for, the, for a considerable amount of CO2. So uh, quite a, several research, computational researchers are developing methods in order to uh, characterize the properties of, uh, of cements and try to predict their behavior. So we organize um, an event where uh, two researchers, Katarina Ioannidou from, uh, from MIT now at Montpellier, uh, show how she's uh, developing multi-scale modeling from uh, atomistic to, multi to uh, continuum to try to predict properties of cements. And then Tullio de Faria, uh, now at Paris Saclay, gave a talk uh, and uh, gave a talk where you show how, what is the behavior, how we can predict the behavior of water molecule inside nanopores of uh, cementitious materials. Then on, in another event that was carried out, that was uh, conducted in, uh, at the end of 20, 2019. So um, it happened that, uh, so we organized an event where uh, uh, two researchers, Steve Fitzgerald and uh, Benna Lerma, uh, here in the UK, described how they showed uh, the, how they, they develop mathematical models to mo uh, mathematical models to describe the, the uh, dynamics of dislocation in materials. And also, we're very lucky that we managed uh, to have a talk by Professor Mick Brown from Cambridge. So, Mick Brown is been defined a giant in the field of structural materials because of the development of a model of work 
to uh, model hardening, a phenomenon that was described by Alan Cottrell as the most challenging problem in all classical physics. So, so for example, in this, uh, in this figure here, you show how you know, a, 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 a cartoon which depicts that a metal under load, uh, uh, indeed a metal that is under load, so what you can describe that as a large number of dislocation uh, that uh, impede one another to progress. Okay, so we're very lucky that we had the Mick Brown presenting his, uh, his groundbreaking, uh, uh, very groundbreaking work in this field. So what have you planned for next year? So we have several activities. So we have, we have a soiree of machine learning that, will be up, that is applied to chemical processes. And for this, we will have uh, two speakers. One is Pavlo, uh, Pavlo de Dral from Xiamen University. He will talk about machine learning or potential ion surfaces. And also we will have uh, uh, a speaker from industry, from IBM, Teodoro Laino, who will talk about development of uh, novel tools uh, where artificial intelligence is applied to, um, to predict chemical processes. Also, we can confirm that we have an highlight tool from uh, David Strolovitz from Hong Kong University. Again, we'll show his groundbreaking work on the studies of structure properties and formation of uh, solid state materials using different uh, type of techniques. So if you want to be involved in the structural materials uh, group, just drop me an email or give me a call. That's, these are uh, my contact details. And in particular, if you want to have, uh, uh, you know, to try to invite uh, resources that work in this area, you know, I will be very welcome, I will be very happy to, uh, to throw, try to make it uh, with you. Okay, thanks a lot. I, I finished my talk. Thank you very much, Devis. That's great. So next on the list, we have um, uh, Johannes Lishner from Imperial College London. Thank you, Johannes. Yep. Uh, let me share my screen. Desktop. Uh, is that working? Do you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Do I make that small? All right. Um, Welcome everybody, uh, also from me. And uh, my name is Johannes Lischner. I, I also work at, at Imperial College and I am the spokesperson of the TYC uh, Functional Materials Interest Group. And uh, the first question that you might ask yourself is, uh, what is a functional material in the first place? And uh, so to answer that, I, I basically dug up this definition from the uh, Materials UK report on functional materials. So, and, and that says functional materials are defined as those materials that perform specific functions other than possessing a load bearing capacity. So essentially the definition is a negative one. Functional materials are potentially all material, materials that are not structural materials. So uh, let, let's try to see what these functions might be uh, that, that functional materials could have. And uh, those include, for example, a semiconducting behavior, magnetism, dielectric properties, piezoelectricity, pyroelectricity, ability to conduct ions in, in the solid state, or ability to store atoms uh, for later use. So, so all of these are uh, in, in this broad class of, of functional materials. And uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, of course, these are interesting because they have a, a variety of applications, uh, many of them already mentioned by Arash and, uh, and, and Tilda. Um, so of course, semiconductors, of course, play a fundamental role in, in information and communications technology. It's a lot of interest in, in energy storage and, and generation, um, transport, healthcare, uh, defense and, and consumer goods are, are all applications where uh, functional materials uh, play an important role. Um, let me uh, show you quickly what are things that might be hot topics in, 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 in functional materials. I mean, uh, there, there are so many. So I, I just picked out uh, three, uh, three things that might be considered hot topics. Um, so one uh, thing that's currently uh, in, you know, of interest to a lot of people is the development of new materials for uh, solar cells. And uh, there was a, a very exciting uh, discovery a few years back of uh, um, these novel uh, organic, inorganic perovskites that are, that are shown here, where you have sort of an inorganic uh, scaffold and inside it there's a little 
organic molecule. And these materials, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the increase in, 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 the, uh, in, this, uh, in, the, in the energy transversion, uh, energy conversion efficiency was, was really fast. So it went from a couple of percent, uh, very briefly, uh, very quickly, uh, almost to 30%. Um, so, and that's of course more than uh, sort of uh, standard uh, silicon solar cells have uh, as an efficiency. Slight problem with these uh, solar cells is that they're sometimes not so stable. Sometimes they contain elements like lead um, that, you know, are, are a bit poisonous. So there's a lot of research in understanding uh, why these materials work so well as, as solar cell absorbers and, uh, you know, how they can be tweaked to, to become slightly better. Uh, so that's one hot topic. Then another hot topic that's very close to my own heart is uh, the uh, research on, on low dimensional materials in general and, and two dimensional materials in particular uh, for uh, development of ultra small electronic devices. Here you see uh, a picture of a, a, a transistor where uh, that, that is uh, whose central component is a monolayer of molybdenum disulfide, which is a, a two-dimensional semiconductor with a band gap not, not too dissimilar from, from silicon. So there is hope that by replacing silicon in, uh, in, in, in transistors with these uh, two-dimensional materials, you could further shrink components and, and thereby, thereby increase performance of, of electronic devices. And then uh, last but not uh, least, uh, I also want to mention the batteries. Of course, uh, uh, Tilda already uh, talked about batteries. Um, but in the UK, there's currently a strong initiative, uh, the so-called uh, Faraday Institute, to uh, basically boost uh, battery materials and uh, develop new uh, materials for, for energy storage. And uh, as, as Tilda stressed, that's a very challenging field that where interfaces play an important role. You, so you see there's a lot of overlap between uh, some of these interest groups um, and uh, new battery materials, for example, uh, those that uh, are focused on uh, storing sodium ions instead of lithium ions uh, are, are being developed um, right now. So, so these are only three of, of potentially many other uh, interesting topics. I, I could also have talked about, you know, uh, multiferroic materials, complex oxides, so you name it. There, there's a lot of interesting stuff, and these are only a three, a, a choice of three. So, so thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Johannes. Right, next up, I've closed my uh, document. So it is, um, we've got Cedric last, I think, and Andela next, Andela Sarek from UCL. Thanks, Andela. Oh, hi, Karen. Hello, how are you? Uh, very good. Yeah, so I good. think I should share something with you. Great. You can see my screen. Yes, lovely, thank you. So hi, everyone, welcome. I'm here to tell you just a little bit about the bio and soft materials interest group. Um, so my lab is in the Department of Physics at UCL, but it's actually physically situated in the Molecular Cell Biology Institute. So what we really try to do is bridge communities, in this case between uh, physics, physical modeling, and real life wet sciences. And um, so I'll just briefly kind of summarize what soft materials are. There is an interesting definition from Dan Frankel that it's everything you cannot bring on the plane, like liquids, gels, aerosols. Uh, so, for instance, surfactants in your soaps, polymer networks like in plastics, liquid crystals, they're all soft materials because they're formed by intricate self-assembly processes where interactions are weak, much weaker than in the examples we've seen thus far in the previous two talks, and thermal fluctuations can compete with these um, weak uh, uh, interactions, so you get all sorts of collective phenomena. And these are super useful, of course, in our everyday lives, but also us humans are very soft. So our hair, skin, body, muscles, they're all soft self-assembled materials. And even if you go deeper at the level of a beautiful cell, it is made of self-assembled basically surfactants, which are uh, lipid membranes. 
and then filaments and networks that are both inside the cell and uh, on the outside. And there is, of course, lots of modeling there. Um, and it kind of spans um, a wide range of land scales. So there is a large community of people who care about the structure and dynamics of individual building blocks of life or soft materials. So the structures and how they uh, change in time, and also even below how electrons are transferred in uh, such structures. But of course, if you want to make something living of the scale of a human, you need to take many, many of such molecules. So there is a whole other range of um, simulations at kind of higher scale, where people look at the self-assembly of these molecules. And there, of course, you need to lose some details, not only because you couldn't simulate these individual molecules without all these details, but you, because you also probably don't care about where each atom goes if you want to simulate something that's at a much larger scale. So here there is a wide range of flavors of kind of um, coarse grained models that simulate the assembly and changes that occur where larger scale structures grow in the cell. And then there's a whole other community kind of at the other continuum scale, which goes more top down. We try to find minimal ingredients and typically describe it in some sort of an analytical way to model the behavior of whole cells, tissues, or even flows within our veins, uh, pumping of heart, and so on. So I think all of that, that would go under modeling in bio and soft matter. So I will not go into many details. I'll just show three uh, that I found cute examples of modeling at each scale. The first one is probably something that you've seen the most, which is atomistic modeling. In this case, is a very recent paper on the spike protein of the corona uh, virus. And there, what you do is you try to describe each atom, right, with a little ball and some interactions between them. And then you try to capture the conformational changes um, of such a protein in this case. And of course, this, it's super useful if you want to design a drug that will bind to it. And if you want to um, understand the details at short time scales of how these molecules interact in the body. And then, as I said, at a larger scale, uh, here is an example of a coarse grain simulation actually from our lab, where we study a whole cell division, which is again, very materials problem. You need to take one ball and split it into two. And here we have a very simple kind of polymer physics model of how dynamical changes in polymer topology and elasticity divide a whole cell, and we can map it to live cell experiments. And here I'm mentioning some sort of uh, experiments that will match simulations at each scale. And then at an um, even larger scale, at the scale of whole cells and tissues, here I'm showing you a simple vertex model where each cell is described just by vertices and springs. And um, in some active forces are included to show their motility. And I'm showing you examples of two um, types of epithelial tissue in, in lungs. On the left are healthy lungs, and on the right you see more fluid, actually asthmatic lungs. And it's interesting because the theory for this sort of um, cellular and tissue behavior actually comes from the theories for glasses, kind of all theories of jamming. And recently it's been there's an explosion of the application of such um, kind of statmec and soft matter theories um, in the case of active behaviors of cells and tissues. Okay, and just a little bit about the hot trends. So what, of course, in my opinion, what I think is super interesting um, is interactions between many molecules and their environment. So traditionally, kind of simulations in biological physics have focused on uh, individual molecules isolated from their environment, isolated from their binding partners. But of course, for any real um, life applications, you need to consider how they interact with their partners. Then uh, what is really hot is uh, non-equilibrium driving forces in softs and biophysics. Of course, we cannot live without energy. And what energy does at kind of a molecular scale, it drives conformational changes to create functional nanomachinery. And those simulations are definitely uh, very trendy now. And of course, it's also important to understand that things coming together is very important, but also things falling apart is extremely important because you cannot have a living machine if you don't have a cycle. So um, simulating kind of controlled disassembly is also one of the up and coming topics. Of course, traversing scales as in any other topic. 
And uh, what I think is super interesting is that such simulations are increasingly mapping to live experiments, so live cells, live organisms, which is um, very different than mapping to kind of dead um, X-ray structures, which um, was traditionally done maybe decades ago. Uh, and of course, some um, ML and AI approaches to parameterize these or to find new uh, models. And I think I'll finish here. Here's my email. And I'll just say that we have a highlight on November 5th by Helmut Grubmuller from Germany, who's going to speak probably about more optimistic side of simulations. So please do come. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Andela. That was brilliant. Um, OK, so last of our interest group leads to talk is George Booth from King's College London. So welcome, George. Thank you. Hi, Karen. Thanks a lot. Let me just try and share my screen. Uh, let's give this a go. Ooh. Is that working? It is indeed. Excellent. All right, excellent. So um, yeah, no, I'd like to, to speak to you all very briefly about the, uh, the methods interest group from a, a very sort of biased and self-centered perspective. Um, so so uh, yeah, my name's, my name's George Booth. I'm at King's College London. I've, I've taken over the, the methods interest group only this week from, from Cedric Weber. Um, but um, really, from my from my perspective, you know, I very much see methods as as really sitting in the in the heart of all of, of the the other things that that are uh, are done in in the TYC and in materials modelling. Um, a more diplomatic way of saying that might be that it has has a large amount of overlap with all the other uh, the interest groups that we've already already heard. Um, almost by definition, if we want to do some kind of materials modelling. Um, then we first of all need to think about which sort of method we're going to be using in order to do that, right? What's the most appropriate method that allows us to extract the physics that we want um, to be able to get the right results for the right reasons, right? And so developments in methodology can have an absolutely a huge impact on all of these other areas of materials modeling. Um, and so it's a very crucial thing uh, to be able to do and to be able to keep up to date with the latest developments. Um, in methods. Um, so since it has such a, a broad scope, um, you know, I, I only have a very kind of personal viewpoint on this um, and, and the scope of methods that people use throughout the TYC is absolutely vast. So, so, you know, perhaps more than any other research group, this is one where I really value your input to excite, to, 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 to recommend exciting speakers, exciting topics, you know, things to arrange um, and, and events to hold. Um, so do get in touch with me. Um, but broadly, we can, we can, you know, think about these methods in terms of improving uh, the efficiency um, of existing methods, uh, improving the, the scope of methods, um, and improving the accuracy. So when I talk about, you know, efficiency, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, we, we've already heard a number of times about the need to go to large enough length scales and time scales in order to access the physics we want. Now, some of this will be very much just simple hardware development, right? Can we throw more computer time at it? Can we take advantage of new architectures, things like GPUs, co-processors, um, and improve parallelism strategies? Um, and of course, that's only going to get us so far. They're important and interesting developments. Um, but there are also going to be algorithmic developments, right? How can we how can we improve um, how can we improve the um, uh, how can we improve the description uh, of our, our problem? How can we work in a different representation? Uh, how can we um, perhaps work with uh, a new way of formulating the problem such that we add in some uh, stochasticity in the problem to allow us to make uh, make progress and go to, to larger length and time scales. Um, how can we also maybe improve the scope of the method? How can we reduce some of the approximations we made or extract out uh, uh, um, interesting quantities that perhaps weren't ex accessible before, for instance, including thermal fluctuations in the environment that perhaps were neglected 
um, or be able to include the effects of solvation or something like that in, in some way um, if it was, was not included before, right? So all of these are important developments to be able to include more physics in the problem and ensure we get the, the as I said, the right results for the right reason. Um, and then finally, of course, what we're always interested in is accuracy. How can we reduce or systematically reduce some of the approximations uh, that we've made to be able to test how important those approximations were in the understanding of the system that we were we were working with. So I've been asked to, to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, and, and again, from a very, very personal perspective, some of the things that I found interesting in, in method development in, in the recent years. Um, and the first is, oh, if I can change slide. I'm going to have to go down here. Yeah, the first um, that I wanted to talk about is quantum computing. Um, quantum computing is something that's been, you know, long fetid. It's originally proposed by Feynman saying that, you know, quantum systems should be emulated on a quantum system, on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a quantum um, computer. Um, and, and, you know, they've long held promise as a way of, of, of getting over uh, some of the limitations of, of classical ways of computing. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the driving uh, of quantum computing is being done, uh, not in academia, actually, but in, in companies, uh, all the way from startups, all the way up to the big tech companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, um, and so on. Um, and, and often they don't really understand much about materials modeling, but they're also interested in, in applying these new quantum computing devices to the problem of materials modeling. It's often been described as, as the kind of killer app of quantum computing. Is it something that we can use in the short term with the very limited quantum computers we have to really make progress on a lot of problems? Um, and there's, there's good reason to think that might be the case. Um, but it's very important also that the that, that academia and, and students understand the limitations of quantum computing to be able to, you know, talk to actually the, the large number of, of, uh, of, um, of companies that are, are working on these problems um, and be able to help them make progress. Um, so we all know that, you know, Moore's law is, is not going to continue forever. Um, and, and quantum computers are getting more powerful. There's, there's an equivalent law, Rose's law, which actually says that, you know, the number of qubits, which is a kind of proxy for the size of a quantum computer, is actually growing at a double exponential uh, uh, rate. Um, and, you know, you can do stupid things like extrapolate out to, to, to how far it will, it will take. And it's only a, a few years till we'll be able to, you know, from first principles, compute the, you know, the active uh, the active sites of enzymes and, and a little longer, a couple more years until we're really simulating from first principles the, the kind of conformational surfaces of, of protein. Um, I, you know, you have to take this with a, a large enough pinch of salt to denature all those proteins. But, but you know, there's no doubt that this is an evolving uh, technology and one that is quite interesting um, and, and one that it's worth the materials modeling community to, to engage with. Um, you know, currently we're limited to very, very small systems of, of just two or three atoms. Um, but last year, quantum supremacy was achieved. Um, and, and now they, they, they have at least a demonstration of a single example where they were able to solve a problem that could not be done uh, on classical computers. Um, but the key thing is that it requires a complete rethink of all the algorithms that we take for, for granted on, on classical computers. There's no LARPAC for, for, for for quantum computers. Quantum computers are incredibly limited. They can essentially just do unitary operations. Um, that's because quantum mechanics is intrinsically a unitary theory, right? The time evolve of a, of a, of a, of a quantum system is e to the minus i h t. You're just being able to change h a little bit, um, but ultimately everything's unitary. Uh, so that you know rules out simply diagonalizing things or, or solving linear equations or, or even things like uh, uh, um, Monte Carlo methods. Um, so you know there's a lot of development there that, and a lot of potential for the for the materials modeling community to engage with that and really and really push forward. One of the other things that we've we've heard a lot about already is is the advent of machine learning and machine learning techniques to help within the entire range of uh, materials modeling problems um, and you know there's a lot of hype and hyperbole and, and things being oversold with machine learning but, but at its core it's a way of automatically parameterizing functions in high dimensional spaces 
And that's something that is routinely done in, in materials modeling, uh, whether you're doing some kind of statistical sampling, uh, for calculating free energies or, or, or thermodynamic quantities, uh, or whether you're doing, um, you know, searching in high dimensional potential energy surfaces. Um, and there are a huge number of applications and, and, and here are just, just a few. Um, so, for instance, you might be interested in trying to develop a new thermoelectric property and so you can find some descriptors uh, for things that have known thermoelectric properties um, and then you can try and devise one of these automatic models uh, to try and work out where is the likely search space for new thermoelectric. Um, similarly, things like potential energy surfaces, uh, if we can parameterize how uh, the, the, the energy of a molecular or, or solid state system changes with distortions in geometry or by swapping out uh, one potentially atomic species for another, then we can start to, uh, then we can start to try and do confirmational sampling on it. We can start to try and find out structural properties all within this model um, and that can vastly improve the scope of what's achievable. Um, and more recently, um, and this is from actually some of my own work, um, a lot of people have been thinking that actually the wave function itself is an incredibly high dimensional object in somewhat more of an abstract uh, space, but this is also something that's amenable for then uh, the use of, of uh, machine learned models to try and directly uh, infer what this wave function is without having to directly parameterize it. So, you know, this is a topic that's hugely exciting. There are a lot of pitfalls. There are a lot of uh, things that you need to be aware of. Um, but at its core, it's, it's really having a very large impact on, on, on methods and models uh, in, across the entire range of materials modeling. Um, so finally, my, my, my final example, and, and you know, again, this, this is you know, a very small subset of, of hot topics in, in, you know, in the wide scope of, of, uh, of, of method development. Um, but one of the things is, is beyond, going beyond density functional theory. So, so density functional theory is often called the kind of workhorse of ab initio material science, right? If we want to try and uh, derive from first principles, uh, structural um, and, and, and functional properties of material. Uh, but, you know, it is known to have, um, ha have some quite severe limitations. It still, for instance, can't correctly dissociate the hydrogen molecule in general. Um, and, and the known approximations that, that, uh, that go into devising uh, the, the correlation functions uh, of density functional theory don't seem to be getting better with time. So one way that this can be seen is, is in, in, from the perspective of the electron density, which should be uh, correct for the correct density functional theory and, and essentially more modern uh, density functionals with increasing parameterization don't appear to be essentially routinely improving uh, beyond about the year 2000. So if we want to be able to have methods that can, can you know, uh, get things to very high accuracy perhaps, uh, to solve some of these problems where there are strong correlation effects that aren't treated well at the level of density functional theory, then we're going to have to look elsewhere and devise new methods. Um, and there are a whole range of, of, of methods uh, that are very exciting and promising in that they can now start to really be routinely applied to the solid state in the thermodynamic limit. And this includes uh, the use of kind of new quantum variables, so moving away from the density to things like Green's function theories uh, or even wave function theories that were traditionally not thought to be at all possible in the solid state. Uh, do things like quantum embedding and work out how to do that correctly to really have a multi-scale approach to electronic structure in materials um, and devise new algorithms. Uh, so, you know, in the last 10 years, uh, there's been a lot of development in linear scaling algorithms to improve the scope, but also then kind of admitting stochasticity into, into otherwise traditionally deterministic methods uh, to be able to, to make them uh, more efficient, efficient and more widely applicable. Uh, so with that, I'd like to, to thank you and, and please uh, stress that I would really value people's contributions. So the Thomas Young Center is only really as, as strong as, as the engagement that we get all the way from the leadership, but all the way down to you, the starting PhD students uh, in, in the center. And that certainly applies to the methods uh, interest group. So if there's an area that interests you, do get in touch with me and, and we can start to think about uh, how we can start to engage with people to, to, to get that promoted throughout the, the, the consortium. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, George. And thank you to all of our um, interest group leads for some really good brief outlines of their groups. Um, the next section, we're slightly running over, but uh, the next section, really excited about because you've all submitted some really good questions. And uh, we've got a very um, talented panel to answer those questions for you. So what I suggest with your view, so if I can ask the panel to all switch on your videos and your microphones, and then if people could set up their view so that it's gallery, um, and then what you can do is you can hide non-video participants by clicking on a participant who isn't on video, on the ellipsis on the corner, um, and selecting hide non-video participants. And then hopefully you should get to see all of our panel on the screen at the same time. So I'll do that now for myself. Okay, there we are, there's our panel. Excellent, thank you everybody. So uh, Jang Wen will take over as chair and uh, we've got a list of questions and hopefully everybody can, can come up with some really great answers for you all. Thanks guys. Hi. Hello. Hello. Can you see me? Hey. Yeah, uh, thank you, Karen. And welcome to the Q&A session. Um, my name is Xiangwen and I'm in my third year of PhD with Davis in Queen Mary University of London. Uh, so far, I have participated in many uh, TYC activities and conference. I did the posters in my first year and gave a talk in my second year on the TYC student day. And there are also many great seminars and workshops during these two, uh, two years um, in TYC. So in this session, uh, I'm going to represent the new members of TYC to ask the questions uh, about activities and opportunities offered by TYC and more, some more general questions about undertaking a PhD in this field. And these questions are collected by the Karen from our new members. So here I will go come for the first questions. Is that uh, I understand that TYC can support my PhD project in many ways, but what responsibilities does membership of TYC have? And who are going to take this question? Well, I can answer that if you like. Okay, is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. First of all, you don't have to worry. It's like it's not going to consume any time of your uh, of our valuable time for research that we have. Uh, we, you're not obliged. Anyone, no one is obliged to do anything. We're not anyone is forced to do anything that he doesn't want to. Uh, with TYC, actually, we can't. It, it's members like kindly ask to participate in all these kinds of events that uh, it organizes, like seminars, poster sessions, networking meetings. Uh, and all these uh, activities are like very useful for me, the, the ones that I attended. So, but to answer your question, basically we don't, we're not obliged, we don't have any responsibilities. But we, we have many things, we have many opportunities here, and the opportunity to participate in all those, those very useful uh, activities. Okay, uh, thank you, Asilias. And the next question is, um, do you prefer to write handwritten notes on paper or digitally typed notes? Uh, yep, <clears throat> so I can take that one. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I've done both throughout my PhD. Usually I start with like a rough set of notes while I'm working something out. Uh, but once I've kind of sorted everything, I like to type them up. I mean, so that allows me to have like a, a solid record in my computer of them. Uh, I can then send it to like my supervisors and they can check things. Um, but I mean, most importantly is that if I have a typeset um, like series of notes, then I can use these later on in say a paper that I'm gonna write or it can go into my thesis later on. Um, so I mean, I would suggest both, but once you've finished a bit of work, it's quite good just to type it up when you've just finished it as it's like fresh in your mind. Um, and basically just save it for later. Okay, thank you, Zach. Uh, the next question is, could you give me some suggestions on how to use TYC resources efficiently? Oh. I'll take that one. Um, 
Yeah, so I would say the best thing to do, if you're not sure, is always to check with your supervisor because your supervisor will have lots of experience with this and all the other PhD students. So it's always best to check um, and don't do what I've done before and use too many resources and then get told off and in trouble. Um, don't recommend doing that. Always check with your supervisor. Okay. Uh, so next question is, could you please name few aspects or areas that you benefited that most from the TYC? Uh, I can answer that one. So the one that I've taken the most advantage of is the molecular modeling course um, that spanned the entirety of last year. And it kind of gave me an introduction to a bunch of different topics that since I came from a chemistry background, I didn't have as much experience with. And it also gave me opportunity to meet with other like first year PhD students. As well as that, there are also the TYC seminars and there's also the masterclass courses. So yeah, in general, the courses I found very useful. Okay, thank you, Amir. And next question is, uh, can you recommend any methods to keep an overview about the literature during the whole PhD? I, yeah, I can have a go at this question. Uh, to be honest, it's a question I ask myself a lot of the time. I'd love to hear other people's responses, but I think the main point is like, don't worry about it too much. Once you start on a project, it becomes a lot easier and a lot more obvious what you should be keeping track of. Um, and there, there's great software out there. There's many kind of things you can use like mentally. Um, but I would say it comes fairly naturally um, in general. So yeah, don't worry about it too much. Okay. Uh, thank you. And next questions, I think it's a, uh... They ask the what are the biggest challenges in undertaking a PhD in the field of theoretical simulation of materials? So maybe you guys can give uh, uh, us what's your biggest challenges. Well, for me, the biggest challenge was okay, is actually managing my time, which is like a challenge for any PhD person, right? But if you're an experimentalist, you have like a schedule, like an experiment, you're essentially working around that experiment. But for us, uh, it's a, a completely up to us to manage our time. And that could be also an advantage because during this kind of unprecedented like, situation that we have over here, basically we don't have any excuses. So we can still work from home, we can still work from anywhere. So that's a huge advantage for us right now. But also it's a very big challenge. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to? Yeah, I think... Um... Related to that, it's also because you're not really formally assessed very much. So it's actually hard to know if you're making progress um, sometimes. So, you know, and you, you can't really compare yourself to other people because people have very different kinds of projects. Um, so, yeah, I think the best thing to do is really just keep talking to your group members and your supervisor and so on. Yeah. Completely agree with that. Okay, I think next question is really related to this one is what, in your opinion, did you find was the most difficult thing about transition from undergraduate to a PhD? Uh, have you got any advice that will help with this? Anyone? I mean, I think I'd say the, so the point I just made is very relevant here. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, the, biggest of challenges maybe yeah. yeah maybe another challenge maybe is that um uh at undergrad i guess you don't really need to make decisions about things you kind of just go along with the flow whereas in a phd you actually need to make decisions which is harder than it sounds <laughs> um, but again you have your supervisor and co-workers to guide you through that kind of thing okay uh, thank you. And the next is what has been the best thing about the PhD so far? So, yeah. Yeah, I can give that one a go. <clears throat> um, so I think one of the best thing, well, one of the things that I've enjoyed the most uh, in my PhD is actually going to uh, conferences. Um, so last year I went to the APS March meeting in Boston. And I really quite enjoyed that, just being amongst so many other Kind of physicists and material scientists doing very similar things to me just kind of gave me a lot of motivation um, like to do with my project um, and also traveled to Paris to do um, 
more specific uh, conference on just Maori materials. And I really enjoyed that. Um, I mean, at the moment with um, uh, COVID-19, I guess conferences aren't really, well, in-person conferences aren't really going to be a thing, at least for the next year or so. Uh, but actually, I think the conference I enjoyed the most happened over this summer. There was a, a Zoom conference that was supposed to be held in Spain, but I mean, it's just um, the number of pe people attending, it was 800 instead of 200 in person. It's absolutely crazy. Um, there's a number of people in the, in the content within like one week it was just, it was fantastic. Um, so yeah, uh, I think hopefully you guys are gonna enjoy that when, when you start to. Yeah, the next question is that we, we all know that there are many activities that run by the universities. So they ask what, uh, how, to T, how do TYC activities differ from that kinds of uh, activities? Well, essentially, that the TYC activities are yeah focused on uh, material uh, modeling, uh, but it covers like such a wide range as we see from the previous presenters. It covers such a wide range in different fields or molecular or, or material modeling. Uh, so, with TYC, you also going to have like the opportunity to attend meetings, seminars that may have to do with topics that are completely different from what from your research groups research from your groups research. And, and also, it is a great way to be part of the community because this is like collaboration between uh, four universities to get to know different students. It feels like community because you communicate your work with other students that might do relatively uh, close to your topic research and discuss with them your interests, maybe same materials that you use, same methods. And in some cases, they might have to face the same problems that you have faced. So that's a great advantage that TWSC have gave me well, through these networking meetings that I've attended. Okay, thank you, Asenius. And next question is, what is point of science? Uh, yeah, I'll say that one. So um, throughout your PhD, there's loads of cool extra bits that you can do. And I think one of the great things about being a PhD student is you have freedom over your time. So point of science is a good example of something you can get involved in in London. It's a it's an outreach event where basically scientists give talks in pubs about their work to members of the public. Um, and it's just a really good way to kind of give something back with the research you're doing and, um, you know, talk to people about what it's like being a scientist. And it's something that I've organized in my time and I had loads of fun doing, but there's loads of other things you can do if you want to do outreach, like become a STEM ambassador. So you can go into schools and talk to school students about what it's like being a scientist and um, don't be afraid to get stuck in and, I think it helps get some balance with your research if you're doing other stuff too. Yeah, thank you, Bethan. And the next question is that uh, they ask the, if there are any materials modeling course you suggest. Uh, I think there are courses on every Wednesday that they talk about before and do you have any other suggestions? Uh, have you guys any take uh, about the materials modeling course? I mean, there's, there's that and there's loads of other resources online. There's loads of uh, seminars going on and so on. So just find what you're interested in and yeah, you can find stuff online. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next question is about the journal club the journal club from TYC. So do you have any describe about the journal club or something? So, so the journal club is like a meeting, half like fortnightly. Uh, we're like uh, every two weeks, like a student uh, presents. It could be a student, it could be a postdoc. And in some cases we have like guest presenters uh, where they present like a paper, a publication that they find interesting, that they want to talk about, discuss it. And uh, it is a, like it's presentation and students can attend that like online uh, due to the current situation. They can ask questions. And this is a great way for our students from members from the YC to practice uh, their presentation skills, uh, to communicate their interests. And uh, apologies if, uh, and so you don't have to worry about like uh, when it's gonna be, it's gonna be two weeks from now. 
I'm going to send you a reminder if you want to, do it, uh, to attend the meetings, like every two weeks. And apologies if I, if I spam you on emails. That's my only apology. Sometimes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question is that uh, some people say that they have never touched about the research of this field. So the, they never uh, tried maybe simulations or physical things before. So how can I quickly adapt to my PhD research? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so I just say, like, don't be scared to ask lots of questions and speak to other students in your group and just know that it will get easier. I mean, like I've got lots of chemistry in my PhD and I literally like hadn't done chemistry since I was 15 before I started. And now I'm in my fourth year and I can talk about it fluently and I understand it all, I hope. So like just persevere, it, you'll feel a bit overwhelmed for a bit, but you'll get there with hard work. Yeah, okay, thank you. And the next, next question is that, uh, when do you think it's the best time to start your program? Um, before we start our research, we need some time to learn the new field and take some time to plan the research. Four years uh, is not a long time. Uh, if preparation time is too long, then the time for research will be short. Uh, if we don't get well prepared, we may find that we got into a wrong way when we have been working on our research for a while? Uh, I can uh, take that one. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I personally think it's best to do both at the same time. Um, you can spend a lot of time preparing, but there's a risk you spend too much time preparing on something that you won't use at all. Because uh, I was kind of in a similar position and it might be more efficient to just start your research and also get an understanding of it at the same time. Um, and if you find out you have something that you don't understand, you can just work on it as you go. Um, I found that I, I got a lot of understanding out of just doing something blind. Like, uh, for example, some concepts that I didn't understand, I, I understood a lot better after I tried coding it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think sometimes maybe if you prepare a lot, maybe you change your, you change a uh, in the halfway of the project. So I think the uh, Amir is yeah. really good suggestions. And the next question is that I wanted to ask for advice on dealing with anxieties and finding my fit in my project. Because right now, even though I have the complete support of my supervisor, I still feel really lost. This is probably because of the pandemic I'm struggling to get into a routine as a PhD life is really different to undergraduate life. Uh, I don't mind taking that one. I guess um, I'd say that you'll find your feet and um, also your routines will change. And what works for you in week one is not going to be the same thing that works for you in the final week of year four. Um, but the best thing you can do is, is reach out and talk to your peers because everyone's in the same boat. And especially during the pandemic, we're all having to do something really quite strange. So just speak to other people on your course in your department, other members of the TYC, and you'll realize that you're not alone. And hopefully that will help you come up with ideas of how you can manage your anxieties better. But also, I mean, if you've got, if you're generally worried and you can feel that your mental health is, is you know, um, not great as a result of the pandemic, then reach out to your university support services because there's going to be lots of people within student services that are able to help and support you. So um, it's not, you know, don't be scared to ask for help because everyone's asked for help at some point. I mean, I went through like when I started my PhD, I had some counselling with my university and it really helped me. And, you know, don't be, don't be ashamed of that and make sure that if you need to um, reach out for help, then you get it. Yeah. Thank you, Besson. And the next question is that uh, since uh, our new members are from the four different uh, universities. They ask some advice for PhDs like the expectations of supervisors and the short in introductions about the PhD life in, I think maybe we can go from uh, Imperial College, UCL and Queen Mary and King's. Maybe you guys can represent the PhD in your university. So who, maybe who is from the uh, UCL? 
can give anyone here? I am, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm also. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. Sorry, what was the <laughs> uh, give an overview of what life is like at UCL as a PhD student? Yeah, yeah, I think that was the question. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, right now I'm not really going into UCL. So UCL for me is just my supervisor and my group. Um, I'm not sure how everybody else feels about that. Yeah. Uh, so I don't have anything specifically to say about UCL. Yeah. Well, as I say, but I can tell you that PhD life in general, and it depends on like each individual. Like each individual like has like a different lifestyle. The good thing about the PhD life is you can adjust things of your lifestyle and how because the idea here is like to be as productive as possible. And you can, with the PhD gives you the liberty, gives you the freedom to try different things to make your world to be more productive. So that kind of freedom is one of the biggest advantages of this uh, PhD lifestyle that we're talking about. Okay, thank you. And the next question I think is a uh, last question is, I would like to know what is the best part about being part of the TYC? You want me to answer this questions? Uh, I guess for me, it's the fact that I, I have access to all these opportunities that I would never have known about. So like the, the courses, the seminars, the events, without all of those, I wouldn't have the chance to meet lots of different people from different fields. And yeah, just having access to all of that is really helpful. And it's also just interesting to see research from something that you haven't even thought about before. Yeah. Can, I, can I come in as well? So I um, applied and uh, was given one of the um, junior research fellowships. So I got to spend three weeks in France with a research group over there. And for me, that was just an amazing experience, like science aside, just personally being able to live in a foreign country for a few weeks and experience what it's like working abroad. It's yeah, it was a great opportunity. So there's lots of really uh, good opportunities out there if you just look out for them. Okay. Yeah. Any other? Well, also for me, the, 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 the modeling lecture, to I see lecture. Uh, the course was really useful for me because I come, for example, in my case, I come from an experimentalist background. So it was a nice introduction for me in uh, materials modeling. And But also I attended last year the Students uh, a Day uh, event where I, I was able to present my first poster. It was, uh, I was quite nervous before presenting my first poster. And this, this kind of event allows a really casual way to do presentations, to present your posters, to communicate uh, your work. And this helped me a lot. Okay. Yeah, and also journal club's great. So come along to journal club. <laughs> yes, please come to just join us in the journal club. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have collected now. And uh, thank you, our panel students, and thank you all for joining this Q and A session. Now we'll hand back to Karen. Thank you to our fantastic panel. That was a really, really enlightening and engaging session did brilliantly answering all those questions. It was so interesting. Um, and thank you to our, uh, our new students as well for such great questions. Um, so the fight, we're at the final hurdle now. Um, I'm going to pop you all into groups with our panel members so that you can have a chat. You can talk about what you're going to be studying and uh, very quickly go over who you are. And if you've got any questions for your panel member, then uh, please do answer. So um, I shall see you in about 10 minutes. It, it will go so fast, I promise you. <laughs> So it looks like we've got 25 participants back. So that's great. Thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to our interest group speakers. Thank you to Arash. Um, and, and it's really great to meet you. We're really excited about today and we really hope that we see you at lots of future events. It's a shame that we're obviously all sort of stuck in our um, abodes and we can't all get together for, for beers and seminars and things, but hopefully in, you know, in the very near future we will and we'll all get to see each other face to face. 
Um, don't forget to join the newsletter uh, at the website. Don't forget to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and um, come to all our seminars and the materials modeling course. And yes, VAS, the uh, journal club. Um, and get involved at the TUIC. It's just, it's going to enhance your experience of your PhD so much. So thank you, everyone. And uh, see you all soon, hopefully. Any comments, just let me know. Just drop me a line. And uh, yeah, see you soon. Thank you to Karen and Hafiza for organizing this as well. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you, Hafiza, for calming my nerves before we started. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> all right. See you all soon. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone.